Uh, hi there, my name is Laura Caruso, and this is your virtual introduction to the Williamsburg, Washington, D.C. trip. Um, and I probably should just say the D.C. trip. There is an option to add three days at the beginning of the trip for those of you that would like to add Jamestown, uh, Williamsburg, and Yorktown. But the proposed trip is a Washington, D.C. field study tour. It's August 31st through September 5th. Um, I guess we'll just go ahead and jump right in. So I'm going to um, change my slide here so you can see the PowerPoint presentation. And let's see, we'll move me right here. All right. So um, you'll notice one of the things that will be helpful to you as we walk through um, the details of the trip is to actually have the flyer for your trip printed out and in front of you. And then feel free to take some notes or write down any questions that you may have. And um, I'm happy to answer those. Just communicate with me uh, via email and I'll get those answered for you. Um, the flyer is available online, so with the trip that you've selected, there should be a link there where you can access the flyer and download it. All right, let's get started. I'd like to introduce a little bit about me um, because you're entrusting, I know you're making an investment with your family to take this field study tour um, with me. So a little bit about me, I'm married to my husband Brett for almost 30 years and this is our only daughter, Kaylin. Kaylin was homeschooled from third grade on and home education is really what led me into doing this. And I know Brett would agree with me that um, home education rocked our worlds it redeemed our educations and he would say it was one of the best choices that we've ever made. It really changed a lot um, about how we thought um, and uh, how we lived as a family. So um, that's kind of a little bit of the backstory. Um, immediately after we started this homeschool journey, the very next year, um, the lady in the picture with me is my pastor's wife, Joy Chambers, and she had started a homeschool co-op. So um, I joined her at the co-op and then uh, jumped into leadership with her, and she and I co-directed um, a 40-family co-op in St. Cloud, Florida, just south of Orlando, um, for many years while our young people were growing up. Now, she had eight, and I had one, so <laughs> together we made a great team. Um, I began teaching history in the co-op, and I want to give you just a little bit of backstory on that, um, just because it's so much a part of how God has really worked in my heart and in my life. The very first year of homeschooling, you know, not wanting to get anything wrong, we registered with a covering school, an umbrella school, and um, it was a large private school in Orlando, and part of what they required um, for their home education um, department was that we were to be treated just like their teachers were. So we needed to do in service parents, homeschooling parents, we needed to do in service hours or training hours. And they offered some options for us. And um, in God's providence that year, one of the options was teaching history from a biblical perspective. Now, I'd always loved history, enjoyed it. And um, in fact, not bragging on myself, there's a point to this story, but um, I graduated from Lake Howell High School and I was the top history student in my senior class. And the reason I tell you that is that as I began to sit under the teaching um, of a wonderful woman there, she presented history not as the story of what man had been accomplishing through all of time, which was really how I had always approached history, but rather that history was truly God's story. It was his story with Jesus Christ as the focal point that God had literally carved time out of eternity, right? And that the story that he was painting through time was a redemptive, beautiful story to bring glory to him and for our good. And as we began to look at history from that perspective, acknowledging God's sovereignty over all of it, my jaw just kind of dropped. Um, I had grown up in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor, and yet somehow I had kind of missed that view um, of history. So it just really in, it brought it to life for me. And um, part of the training that we had was really um, about becoming a living textbook, really digging into uh, primary resources yourself, becoming knowledgeable so that you could bring to life these wonderful principles um, of, uh, of history. So I have a particular interest in American history, but it's all fascinating. It's all God's story. But we're going to talk specifically, of course, about American history as we address this tour. 
So I began teaching history in 2003 and did my first little mini trip in 2004, just a very small group. And then just a few years later, took a group of 40 um, from my co-op. Because again, as we began to tell those stories about God's providence, his hand moving through history, I felt there was no more powerful way to experience those things, to really drive those lessons home into the hearts of our young people than to stand in the very places where those events happened, where uh, where we knew, you know, a sacrifice was made or a miracle occurred, you know, where God's hand was seen and our founding fathers wrote about it. Um, so all that to say that that was the beginning of that. My first big trip um, was in 2007. So been at this a little while. Gosh, 12 years. This is my daughter and our, our daughter, I should say, and my big old family. And um, I put that in there just to say they they do grow up and homeschooling works and they graduate. And so she is a proud graduate of Liberty University. Um, uh, she uh, not only achieved her undergraduate there, but then was hired by the university and went on to become a master's candidate there. And then a young man entered her life. Uh, this young man, let me move myself out of the way. This young man um, next to her, Ryan Gyra. So they married in 2016 and we are now excitedly awaiting our first grandbaby. So that's a little bit about my uh, my family background and um, kind of where we are in life now. I wanted to fill in just a couple gaps for you in case you're familiar with some of these uh, ministries. So um, during the time that Kaylin was in high school, a number of her friends, our co-op was very um, involved in, in encouraging attendance to teen packed leadership schools. They're a nationwide ministry, and I encourage you, if you've not heard about teen packed, to investigate them. Um, they really are one of the most wonderful uh, ministries for really engaging our young people um, in how to impact their culture, teaching them the biblical principles of government and how uh, making that accessible to them through their state capitals. Classes are actually held in the state capital uh, buildings across the United United States. Um, and then really allowing these young people to lead in ways that I've not seen in very many uh, ministries. So I highly recommend teen packed leadership schools to you. And I mention it because if you can pick me out, I'm I'll circle. There I am. Uh, but I served as the state coordinator for several years during um, Caitlin's high school years. So that is part of my background. And then during a, the couple of years um, after she graduated and I was felt like I was in a little bit of a limbo situation, you know, where did God really want me to go and how could I serve? And um, so I wound up serving in the 2012 election season as a field director um, in the Orlando area for Florida Family Action. Um, and then shortly after that, um, became involved, uh, Common Core became a major issue here in the state of Florida. And um, I felt that it was really important, particularly for private school and homeschooling parents to understand the impacts of Common Core on them. And so um, I began to investigate, develop presentations, and then travel the state to bring people up to speed on Common Core. All right, so that's just a little bit of that. But my real love, where I really feel that God has called me, is um, is working with parents to shape young minds. Um, we have a responsibility. Ultimately, education is a parental responsibility. Of course, there are wonderful resources today where we can delegate some of those responsibilities, but ultimately it's us. It's we who must give an answer um, for how those young people's um, uh, minds have been shaped. And so I'm happy and um, delighted to serve as a resource to come alongside parents and to help in that regard. Um, I have a real heart for young people and for the challenges that they face today. So here are some images. Um, actually, I think only one of these is in the classroom. The others are out uh, in the field. So um, I'm teaching, but teaching at Mount Vernon or um, the bottom image is we're actually touching part of Plymouth Rock um, up in uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts. So I'll keep rolling here. Um, I wanted to begin the presentation with um, just a little reminder or a thought about um, the foundations of why we do what we do, why I do what I do. This struck me um, in that first class that I took teaching history from a biblical perspective. That's where I heard this verse explained really in a way that I'd not heard it before, not paid attention to before. Um, so in Acts 17, 26, the scripture says, this is Paul speaking, and he says he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, right? God created every nation 
and spread them out on the face of the earth. Having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that's ahead of time. He determined their appointed times when they would rise and fall and what the boundaries of their habitation would be. We can think back to the Roman Empire, the growth of this mighty, mighty nation, um, and know that God ordained when Rome would rise and fall and just how far its boundaries would stretch and when they would then contract. Same thing with the Soviet Union. Same thing with the United States of America. So when we look back at history, it's so important to remember that God truly is sovereign. But not only is he sovereign over all of it, appointing the times for nations to rise and fall, the boundaries of their habitation, but the scripture tells us why. So they would seek God. What a beautiful picture. That's what it's all about. That's the focal point of history. Jesus Christ, the, um, the salvation that's offered through the sacrifice of a perfect savior. So everything prior to Christ was looking forward to him and everything since has looked back. That's the perspective that we'll take um, as we as we study history, as we study America's role in that big picture. We're remembering that God is sovereign, that he has caused America to be what she is, when she is, for his purposes, for his glory, and for our good. I want to actually, or not actually, I want to also um, go through this verse, which began to have a lot of very important meaning to me. It uh, became kind of a theme verse or theme a passage for what I do, and that's Psalm 78, uh, verses 1 through 11. It says, Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. You all know what a parable is. It's a story. Dark sayings of old, those old stories. I'm going to tell you those stories. We've heard and known. Our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. Those are the stories that we are challenged to rehearse in the ears of our children. Tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. What a beautiful picture of multi-generational faithfulness. But Moms and dads, it starts with us teaching our children truths, rehearsing those old stories in their ears, reminding them of the mighty works of God, the wondrous things that he has done. Then we have this next line that explains again, why? Why is it so important that we do that? So that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God. I think you'd agree with me that as we look out in the culture today, it's a battleground. It's a difficult place. The worldview, the beliefs of our young people will be challenged. Well, will they put their confidence in themselves? Will they put their confidence in their ability to speak well? Or will they put their confidence? I'm not saying those things aren't important. Well, you know, I don't want them to put their confidence in their history class or, or the, the knowledge that they have. All of those are important tools to have in your tool belt. But at the end of the day, we have to put our confidence in God and not forget the works of God. Because you see, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. The God that's spoken about here in the context of the Israelites is the same God we serve today. And he's not done doing mighty works. So, next line. They should put their, we want our young people to put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and not be like their fathers, meaning our generation, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Now, moms and dads, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody watching this video, but our generation is a wicked one. We have turned away from God. 
we have forgotten the foundations of our own country where we fully recognized the intervention of God. We are a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Now the psalmist inserts right here this interesting little anecdote, an illustration in fact. He says, the sons of Ephraim were archers equipped with bows, yet they turned back in the day of battle. Well, what's up with that? Why is that in here? Well, the, the, uh, the sons of Ephraim, when they talk about that group of men, the sons of Ephraim were like special forces in the Israeli army. They were archers equipped with bows. They were some of the most fearsome warriors out there. In order to be an archer, to stand, you all have seen those movies, Troy, whatever you've seen, where they stand, you know, shoulder to shoulder almost, and they're, they're big buff guys because they've got to draw that bow over and over again, and they just rain down death and destruction on the enemy. And those bows were the, um, the high tech weapon of the day. And they had it. So, they had the best technology, they had the best training, they, you know, were, they were physically fit like nobody else was in the Israeli army, and yet these guys, the special forces, the sons of Ephraim, they turned back in the day of battle. Well, what, how did that happen? I mean, can we even imagine in our minds sending in the Navy SEALs or the Army Rangers and them turning back in the day of battle? No. But yet that happened. Well, the psalmist explains, they didn't keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. They forgot his deeds and his miracles that he had shown them. They began to trust in themselves, in their technology, right? Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. That, again, is the perspective with which we'll address this whole trip. We want to look for how has God worked through the story of America. Where did he supply need? How did he provide? There are so many places where our founders acknowledged that, their great need. We were weak in the beginning. Um, it was truly a miracle that America was born. All of that background, your young people will have before we go. They'll have a, a, or a good bit of that background. Um, this is probably a good place for me to introduce, um, let me come back out here to me, to introduce this. So one of the things that's included with the trip is your young people will have a, access to a YouTube video seminar, so much like this with PowerPoint slides, um, but they'll have this packet with note sheets. So they'll track along, filling in as they go. And not only will they have the, the note sheet packet, but they also receive a set of color images. Oops. Upside down. Anyway, color images that are cut out so that they have them ready to go and to glue into place uh, because not only are we studying um, foundational principles, providence, self-government, we introduce a few of those really just important foundational terms um, so that we can build on that, but we also talk through, um, you know, the battles and we talk through the art and the architecture, um, how architectural styles developed in America and reflected the worldview. Um, we even build on that uh, in addition when we're on site in DC. So there are terms they'll need to know in order to kind of discuss, walk through some of that when we're on site. So all of that to say that this background that I'm talking about, this foundations of America, the, you know, when Patrick Henry says there is a just God who presides over the fates of nations, um, the destinies of nations, and, and he will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. You know, just trust God. He's encouraging, he's exhorting these other uh, legislators in Virginia. So they'll have some of that background. They'll understand kind of where we came from so that we can build on those um, principles when we're on site. Let me come back to the slideshow. We are. All right, last introductory statement that I want you to see. Guys, this is taken from the introduction of a textbook that used to be used widely in America in 1848. If you notice right down here's the date, 1848. Here's the introduction. It says, the study of history is the most fitting nourishment to promote, to promote the growth and strength of the expanding intellect of youth. I would certainly agree. Time is precious. And better will be our regret should the days of our youth have been spent without enriching our minds with something of the knowledge of God and of the human race, which is hoarded in the lap of history. 
Did you catch that? What's, what is hoarded in the lap of history? The knowledge of God and of the human race. So see, that was what I was missing. Miss Public School graduate, Lake Hell High School, 1986, <laughs> is I've been studying the human race, but nothing about the knowledge of God that was also hoarded in the lap of history. But having acquired this treasure, we shall feel amply rewarded for our labor as we discern the hand of our Heavenly Father and recognize with grateful hearts the wisdom and goodness of the plan he has prescribed for the advancement of mankind towards civilization and perfection. Thus the study of history, while enriching us with an inestimable knowledge of past generations, is also leading us to a better acquaintance with God. Clearly are we taught that he extends his protecting hand over all his children and that all are called into being to fulfill some wise purpose. You who think that chance has brought forth all that exists and that chance decides the fate of nations and of individuals. Read history with becoming attention and you will soon acknowledge your error and joyfully testify to the great truth that an intelligent, all wise and benevolent being is the creator and ruler of the world. How incredible that this was the perspective from which history was taught in our nation as late as 1848. How sad that we've lost that because this is truth. This is fully in line with what we just talked about in Acts 17, 26. All right, with that introduction, hopefully you've got a little bit of the vision, like that that's, that's the approach we're gonna be taking as we walk through these places, as we go and stand um, stand in the, in the halls of Congress and stand in the places where history actually took place, that that's the perspective that I want to bring to your young people. I want, to, I want them to understand the sources of their liberty, um, that it truly, that the, the principles that are enshrined in our Declaration and Constitution truly are Judeo-Christian. We can trace it right back to the English common law. Your laws here do not come from Rome. That's really one of the most, you know, uh, impactful and important things that we need to understand is that um, up until the time of Jamestown, when the English colonists arrived for the first time in 1607 and established a permanent settlement, when they planted law here, they planted English common law. They did not bring Roman law, which was what all of the Spanish and Portuguese colonies were based on. It was a distinct difference. And again, this is, this is in their note packet, but we'll trace those ideas. Where did common law come from? We can take it back to Magna Carta, and then we can take it back even further. Where did this law that was enshrined in Magna Carta come from? And spoiler alert, it came from literally the, the scriptures codified by a man named King Alfred in 900 AD. But I digress. All right, let me get you to the details of the trip. All right. Um, so here we have the dates listed as August 31st through September 5th. Those would be the dates simply for the DC portion of the trip. I am going to talk you through um, the, the prelude, the optional for, uh, first three days for those of you that want to do those first three days. So I'll do it all in order, but just know that, you know, the DC trip begins on Saturday, August 31st and runs through Thursday, September 5th. All right. Um, this is just to orient you a little bit. So if you begin um, with the, the optional first three days, that would be here in the historic triangle. We stay in Williamsburg. We visit Jamestown and Yorktown. And then on the Saturday, we make the two and a half to three hour trek up to Washington, D.C. You have an itinerary similar to this already in your hand in the flyer, form of the flyer. Um, so in Colonial Williamsburg, we stay at an official Colonial Williamsburg hotel. It's called the Woodlands Hotel. Um, it's a wonderful location. It's very convenient. You can actually walk over to the historic district if you'd like. Um, we also have immediate access to the shuttle system to take you um, over into the historic district, the shopping area, all of that. In the morning, the image in the upper left-hand corner is um, the breakfast room and um, the stay at the woodlands includes a full american buffet breakfast every morning so for our boys along for the trip they get well filled um, while we're at the woodlands and that's included i think i mentioned that anyway included in your stay 
just some other views of the woodlands. There are, um, there are a couple adjacent restaurants, easy access restaurants, or you can certainly hop on the shuttle to get to um, a restaurant. Now, if you do that portion of the trip, if you choose to do those first three days, the optional first three days, you do need a vehicle. So if you're flying in, I have recommendations for which airport, but you would need a rental car, or of course, if you're driving, you'll have your car available. Um, we don't use it every day, don't use your car every day, but we need it for a two of the days of um, um, site visits. And of course you need it to transfer over to Washington DC. You need a vehicle to do that. Okay, that is just an image of the downtown area. I'm kind of giving you, this is where we stay up here and the shuttle system kind of runs around the town, but you're within walking distance um, of the historic district. So again, if you arrive early on Wednesday, Wednesday's check-in day. If you arrived early on Wednesday, you could certainly leave luggage. A lot of folks do, and then just either grab the shuttle or walk on over and enjoy um, the atmosphere of Colonial Williamsburg. So Thursday um, is our first tour day. We start right off in the morning and we head out to the Jamestown archeological site. So this is where the Jamestown colony was planted in 1607. You can see the river behind us there. And one of the wonderful things is it just really gives young people a perspective um, when they can see you know, exactly how those ships entered um, the river, why they chose the site that they did. We talk through those things. Um, they're standing literally in the very footsteps um, of these amazing historic figures. So they'll have a great background on Captain John Smith. They'll have learned about the real story of Pocahontas. Um, as many of you know, Pocahontas marries an Englishman um, named John Rolfe. And I'm excited to tell you, it was an active archeological dig. And up to, gosh, maybe 15 years ago, just not long ago, they, they real, literally thought that the entire site had been lost to the James River, to the, that it receded into the, into the river waters. And thanks to the work of a wonderful archeologist named William Kelso, um, he appealed for the opportunity to at least try and just see what he could find. And literally day one, um, they were finding armor and they were finding post hole stains that indicated the outline of the fort. And as it stands today, about 90% of the fort they've you know, now understand is actually intact. Um, so now again, nothing above ground, it's all underground. And so it's, it continues to be um, an active dig site, which is really fascinating to see what it is they're finding when we're there. Um, uh, in recent years, they've uncovered the first church, um, which is something that I've been waiting for for a long time. Um, so 16, uh, right, 1608, 1607, they were kind of meeting under a, a sail set up like a tent. Um, but the, the first church that they built was built inside the fort and they uncovered the outline of the church. Then they were able to determine, you know, where the chancel would be. Um, and pretty quickly after that, determined that there were actually burials in the chancel, um, determined through DNA testing who those folks were. So just fascinating things. But that means your young people can literally stand in the very footsteps, the very place that John Rolfe and Pocahontas stood um, when they were married among other wonderful things. All right, so we go to the archeological site in the morning. Um, here's some images, move me over. Um, some images of us there um, at the archeological site. And this man in the, the hat here, that is Bill Kelso, um, who was the chief archeologist. And this is a young man I've gotten to know through the years. Um, he's now a senior archeologist on the site. His name's Danny Schmidt. Um, and that's just because I keep coming back and bringing groups. And if he's available, we always ask if he can come out and give us a little um, background on what they're digging at the moment. Um, this is inside another very significant site uh, there at Jamestown Island. Um, all right, I won't give you the whole tour now. But anyway, another very significant site, especially when we talk about the transference of common law to these shores. So your, your first representative assembly, the roots of what we have today that needs protection desperately, this idea of self-government through representatives had its first expression right where we're standing. So right there in a church of all places. So, um, all right. 
So that's the morning we spend there at the archaeological site. Then just about five minutes up the road, um, also on the river, they've recreated what Jamestown settlement would have looked like. So this is an interactive um, reenactment village and museum. As soon as we get there, we head to the Jamestown Settlement Cafe, which actually is a really wonderful lunch. So um, that's another part of the tour. Your lunches are included almost every day. Um, so every day except the very last one. And there's a reason. I'll explain when we get there. Um, so, um, I try to make sure that we have good, healthy options every day. There are also the, you know, pizza, hamburger, chicken finger options, but, um, not all of us can survive on pizza for all those days in a row or want to. So there are great, um, uh, great options for meals each day. You'll have ordered those things ahead of time. Again, my goal is to make the most of your time. So we do a lot of planning ahead so that we can hopefully, you know, move smoothly in, get your meal immediately and make the most of the time that you have there at the attraction. Um, after lunch, I take you through the Jamestown Settlement Museum. It's large. It has a lot of really wonderful artifacts that are worth seeing, but it's easy to get distracted and not find the most important things. So I give you about a 45 minute overview tour and just hit the hot spots. Um, and then we kind of come out the back of the museum and then you're in that um, reenactment village. They have both an Indian village and the Jamestown settlement or the fort. So your young people can do things like scrape a deer hide, grind corn, perhaps watch a Native American um, burning out a dugout canoe. Uh, they can go on board. Let me see if I have pictures of this. I think I do. Yep, there's some images. Here they are. Um, some young people on board the replica ships. So they have the three ships that brought the first Jamestown settlers there, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery. And all three, as long as all three are in port at the, at the time, you can visit, go below decks, you know, really explore the whole ship and get a sense of the great danger, you know, really the bravery that it took to get on a ship like that and cross the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you can go inside the fort, try on armor like these guys are doing, watch a, um, a matchlock musket demonstration, etc. Then uh, we wrap up there, maybe 4, 4.30, and I will make a recommendation for dinner down in the historic district in Williamsburg. Several great options for all budgets. But then we gather um, early in the evening, and I do a candlelight evening tour um, of Colonial Williamsburg. So I'm telling you the stories, giving you the background, kind of helping you understand the significance of the buildings and the people associated with those buildings that night. It is a, a big first day, but again, there's a method to my madness after all these years. So the reason we do that is the next day is your Colonial Williamsburg Day, Friday. And really the only scheduled event that we have as a group is our lunch, which is at a colonial tavern. So it's a sit down served lunch in the in um, either the King's Arms Tavern or the Shields Tavern. Um, now, they are obviously reenactors that are um, interpreting some of the various places. There are guided tours through some of the buildings. And so the reason I do my tour the evening before is that I really I don't want to step on those interpreters. I want you to get the full measure of what they have to share with you and also to have the freedom to go and see the places that you really want to see as a family, places that are priority for you. Um, I do put together an itinerary for the day um, and will lead those that want to go with me to hit some of the high spots make sure you don't miss anything um, but even in my itinerary there are uh, plenty of free time uh, segments so that you can go and see the blacksmith or the milliner or whoever is most interesting to you um, okay so that is our Williamsburg day here's some folks enjoying a tavern lunch by the end of the day oh, other sorry another tavern lunch and some um, folks in front of the magazine. What's really awesome is in Colonial Williamsburg, they have 88 preserved colonial structures, like things that were present at the time the Declaration of Independence was being drafted. Um, so it's really, it just gives you such a feel for the time period um, to walk those streets and stand in those places. Or Williamsburg images. At the end of the day, they do a fifes and drums demonstration. So I do always encourage folks to gather back at the, the green right behind the courthouse at five o'clock so that we can observe that. There's cannon firing and 
military comes out and the fifes and drums are there. And so it's a really fun way to end the day in Williamsburg. The next morning, we are up with cars loaded because we're headed out to Yorktown Battlefield and then we're going to be making the transition over to DC. So Saturday begins again, you know, on that big grassy field and it's a big one. Um, the story of Yorktown is the last battle of the American Revolution. It truly was um, a confluence of providential events. Um, there's some recommended reading for folks, if you'd like, before you come that really gives you a feel for um, the, the really amazing victory at Yorktown. Um, George Washington said after the fact that he is worse than an infidel who will not acknowledge his duty to God following this incredible victory. He also said about himself, I have been but a tool in the hand of providence. Um, so we'll walk you through, you know, well, how exactly did this victory come together? What were these amazing, lucky circumstances and coincidences that weren't, right? If we believe in sovereignty of God and providence, then that rules out luck. It wasn't luck. Um, but to tell the stories and be looking at the very river where the incident took place is really something special. So where we visit several places on the battlefield and we also then go into the little town of Yorktown. Um, again, wonderfully preserved little village kind of setting. Some of the buildings still um, bear the damage from the Battle of Yorktown. And so we'll point some of that out to you, talk about the significant people that were involved that day. Um, one man in particular, we visit his gravesite. Um, how many of you have heard of Thomas Nelson Jr.? And not the Bible publishing company. Well, Thomas Nelson Jr. was a signer of the Declaration of Independence for Virginia. He was also Virginia governor during the war, because you know, we're a brand new state. So we've just declared independence, and he's one of the first governors of Virginia, active during the time of the war itself. And y'all remember at the end of the Declaration of Independence, these men were standing on principle, and they were pledging to one another their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. Well, this man is one who truly gave everything for liberty, life, fortune, and sacred honor. We need to know about him. We need to learn from his example. And so we'll hear his story. Um, his story takes place partly on the battlefield, and then we'll visit his, his gravesite. Um, these are some other images there at Yorktown. This is the Victory Monument. Um, it's sitting up on a bluff, and then the river, the York River, is down below. It's an incredible um, scene there. Okay, some more Yorktown, some more Yorktown. Then we um, we have lunch at a wonderful place there called the, oh gosh, something grill, county grill, <laughs> county grill and smokehouse. So it's a wonderful barbecue restaurant. Again, we fill up those boys. And um, then we hop in the car and it's a two and a half to three hour drive to get into Washington, D.C. You'll notice we're doing this on a Saturday method to my madness, right? So we don't want to drive into the city on a weekday. So we come in on a Saturday, and that also gives us our first day for exploring as a weekend day in the city. We stay at the Holiday Inn Alexandria Carlisle. Carlisle. Um, that's, that, will, that is my go-to hotel. Um, for those of you planning to do this August uh, 31st through September 5th trip, I don't have that hotel locked in yet. It's the one I've used now for several years, but I never can absolutely tell you that's where it will be until I have a contract with them. Um, but if it's not there, it'll be something very similar. And the keys for me are that it's easy access for you um, coming in from the highway. So this one um, is literally at the bottom of the exit ramp. When you come in on 495, you make that if you're still kind of outside of town, just not really outside, but on the, the edge of town, you come down that exit ramp and literally right into the parking lot of the hotel. Um, it also offers free parking. Um, that's unusual in Washington, D.C. It can be 30 or $40 a night to park your car. Um, it is one block from a metro station. That's really important because we're going to use the metro for some of our travel um, throughout the city. And it is one metro stop away from Old Town Alexandria, which is a lovely um, uh, historic area, but lots of shops and restaurants. 
and restaurants from high-end seafood, fine dining to Five Guys and Subway. So, um, and, and then takes you all the way down to the Potomac River. So it's a lovely place to go and find good things to eat. It's also three metro stops from the Ronald Reagan Airport, which is DCA. So again, if you're traveling, um, if you're flying into DC, you can easily just from the airport, take the metro and get to our hotel and same thing as you're headed back. So very easy access to the airport. The hotel does feature an indoor pool and an outdoor enclosed patio area. So our young people really enjoy these amenities in the evenings. Um, this is just an image I wanted to enclose or insert because it shows looking out from like, I don't know, seventh or eighth floor from the hotel. You can see, um, I'll use my cursor here to show you, this is the metro station. This is where we enter and catch the train. Um, right over here on this corner, there's a CVS. So um, they've got a little grocery section and all kinds of things that you might need there. Um, and then this is that exit ramp I was mentioning. Come off the highway and you literally just come right into the parking lot. Um, something to mention too, though, with this hotel is breakfast is not included. So um, you want to either run over to CVS or take an Uber over to Fresh Market or something and probably have some things in your room for the morning, some yogurts and cereal and milk. They do have refrigerators and microwaves, small refrigerators and microwaves in all the rooms. So that is a definite possibility. Um, and then in addition, there is a restaurant in the lobby. So if you prefer to just come down early and do breakfast there, you certainly can do that as well. Um, as I mentioned, we use the metro system to get around D.C. Um, if we're not using the metro, then we're using a private chartered bus, and I'll talk to you about when we do that. So, nope, there we are. There's some young people on the metro. Um, our first day in the city is Sunday, and again, that's purposefully done because we are going to be using the metro, and it's a great day to get to know the metro system when it's not a work day. So it's quiet. Um, we can kind of go over all of the, the safety procedures with our families and um, and then get used to it. Um, so we hop on the metro and our first stop is the exterior of the White House. Now know that when we go, I always request an interior tour of the White House and we just are dependent on White House staff and whether we're granted access or not. So I will tell you in the last um, eight or nine years, I have not been successful, but I am taking a group in just a week and they are they were granted a tour. So we just really don't ever know. And, um, and I will put in the request for you um, through Congressman Webster's office. Um, so again, Sunday, we start here right in front of the White House. We talk about um, the responsibility that we have, the biblical responsibility that we have to pray for our nation, what our responsibility is as self-governed citizens. And then we take a moment to stop and pray for our leaders, for our nation, um, in that very kind of epicenter of power. Um, again, really quite a moment to be standing right in front of the White House um, and to take that time to go to the Lord, the God who's sovereign over it all, and appeal to him for his mercy and thank him for the grace that he's extended to our nation over the years. Um, while we're there, I'll point out um, from the exterior, really kind of, I use visual aids to help them see, you know, where the various rooms are that they're familiar with. Um, we also talk through like where the media is, the West Wing, all that. So they get a good feel for some of the things that they're then seeing on television. Or when they see a reporter, they'll understand kind of where is that reporter when he's doing that stand up. Um, walking through the park, there's some very significant statuary that tells some of the story of America. So we'll talk through some of that statuary. And then we exit the back of the park. Um, and at the back of the park is St. John's Church. Now it's a Sunday, so we won't actually go inside the church, but it's called the Church of the Presidents. So we'll talk about, you know, why it gained that moniker. Um, and some of the significant historical events that are associated with St. John's Church. From there, we hop right back on the metro. It's about a block away. So we hop on the metro and head over to the National Archives. Um, at the archives, we're going to be seeing these, the documents of our freedom, right? The documents that established our nation, um, not just the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Of course, we will see those, um, but we'll start with the Magna Carta. And your young people will understand why the Magna Carta is so significant and why we're displaying it at the United States National Archives. Um, while we're there, you'll notice in this image, you see two large murals on the wall in the Rotunda of Freedom. 
So those are called the Faulkner murals. Again, these are works of art that your young people will be familiar with by the time they've completed the, the video sessions. Um, but I will take the opportunity to stop for a minute and talk back through those, you know, in per live and in person, looking up at these massive murals, um, reviewing together what the imagery is and what it represents. Um, from the National Archives, we just crossed the street and we're at the National Gallery of Art. Um, at the, so here at the National Gallery of Art, we immediately go to lunch at the Cascade Cafe. Um, you again will have selected ahead of time what you'll be having for lunch, so that's a pretty smooth process, but gets us off our feet for a little bit because we'll have had a busy morning. Um, following lunch there at the Cascade Cafe, I'll take you upstairs to the American Gallery. And there again, you know, your young people will have had exposure to a number of these artists, the artists that really gave us the record of our founding period. Um, they'll be introduced to folks like Benjamin West. Have you heard of Benjamin West? Well, I hadn't either, but without Benjamin West, who's called the father of American painting, we would not have the record of our founding that we do. Because you see, a young Quaker boy whose family did not believe in images in the providence of God raised a young man who would become um, a, a world-renowned painter and who wound up providing training to young American artists where there really was no art school, but he trained Gilbert Stewart, um, John Trumbull, Charles Wilson Peale, um, John Singleton Copley, all of these artists that give us the images that tell the story of the beginnings of our nation. So we'll walk through the gallery. It takes um, about maybe an hour, hour and a half to finish that portion of the tour. Um, at that point, it's usually about 2.30 or 3 o'clock. We're right in the middle of the Smithsonian zone. So at that point, you have an option to either come with me and we walk down to the Museum of American History, where I give just a brief overview at the Star Spangled Banner. That's what you're seeing right here. So where we kind of introduce, remind people of the, the story of the Star Spangled Banner, um, the War of 1812, and, and really the miracle victory that, um, that, that gave us the story of the Star Spangled Banner. But tell the story, kind of let you go there, and then I really just give pointers. You know, upstairs is this, I hand out a map and give you a list of the highlights there at the Museum of American History so that you can enjoy that at your own pace. But if, you, if that's not your priority that day, um, you're very close to the Museum of Natural History, the Air and Space Museum, etc. So you certainly could head off in your own direction um, in the afternoon, and then you're on your own in the evening um, for, for dinner and, um, and heading back to the hotel. Monday, Monday morning, we have a private coach that arrives to pick us up and take us out to Mount Vernon. For a lot of folks, this is their favorite day of the entire trip, and it is a beautiful spot. Um, again, it keeps us out of the busy D.C. traffic on a Monday morning and brings us out to this lovely estate setting. Um, we, while we're at Mount Vernon, we do see the orientation film. In some of the locations, I kind of discourage the orientation film. It's not always helpful, but here it's really wonderful. So we, we do the orientation film um, and then we head on out to the mansion itself and you do a, a, a self-guided, essentially, tour of the mansion. There are docents in the rooms that can help explain things, but we'll go through the mansion. We we then visit the grave site of um, George Washington and his wife Martha. Scroll through some images here. Here's the grave site in the upper right hand corner. Um, and then our group in front of the mansion. And then as soon as we visited the tomb, um, there's some time to just explore. We have a one o'clock lunch that day. It's a little bit later, but that gives you plenty of time to go and see what you want to see out on the estate. So at one o'clock, we gather back at kind of the main headquarters, if you will, the main buildings, um, again, for a seated tavern lunch at the Mount Vernon Inn. Um, and then after lunch, they have an incredible museum and education center. I mean, unbelievable. You could spend all day there. Um, what I'll do for you there is a brief introduction, hit a couple of the high points, and then give you uh, a list so that you know, you know, what are the do not miss features and can kind of plan your time accordingly for the afternoon. Um, we leave the Mount Vernon um, uh, venue 
at about four o'clock in the afternoon, head back to the hotel, and this is the one night when you might want pizza or something that could be um, delivered to the hotel <laughs> um, or to eat in the restaurant. So we get back and we have about an hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half to get changed, to get something um, in our bellies, and then to get back on the coach because we're headed out for a monuments and memorials tour that evening. So that's our Monday evening. It's hop on and hop off. So the, the coach is taking us from place to place. We go to the Jefferson Memorial, um, the Lincoln Memorial, which of course also um, encompasses the Korean War Memorial and the Vietnam War Memorial, um, World War II. I'm leaving things out, but anyway, that evening is all monuments and memorials. And it's really a wonderful experience in the evening. Cool, typically less crowded, um, really great time for all of us. Um, Tuesday, we head up to Capitol Hill. So we'll hit all three of the, um, the main sites up on, they literally are on the hill, and that's the Library of Congress, the United States Capitol, and the Supreme Court. Um, so assuming that we start at the Capitol, we never know, um, because uh, thankfully, I have been able to um, secure permission to actually give the Capitol tour, but we work with um, a congressman's staff in order to make that happen. And so depending on their schedule, that's when we'll, we'll have our Capitol tour at their convenience. Um, but assuming that we do that first, um, we do our Capitol tour, um, which is me. And then when our tour is over, there in the Capitol Visitor Center, there's a cafeteria, which again is not your typical cafeteria. Lots of really wonderful options you will have selected ahead of time, so it's a quick, easy process. You're not standing in a big long line. Um, and uh, after lunch, we use the tunnel system to move from the Capitol over to the Library of Congress, where again I'll be giving your tour, talking you through this Gilded Age um, uh, building. Completed in 1898, it is incredible um, the amount of, um, of artwork that's incorporated into the building, the details, really, really beautiful, but they express something about the American worldview at the turn of the century. Um, this is the era of Rockefeller, of Carnegie, um, and so we, something's changing. We, we've just won the Spanish-American War. America's feeling uh, very strong. She's feeling very prosperous. And if you know anything about your studies of the nation of Israel, when they're well fed, when they have, you know, hay in their barns and, and gold in their pockets, what typically happens is that we turn, we turn from our first love. And that's really what we're going to see expressed um, in this building. But we want to talk through that with your young people about how do we see that expressed? How is worldview um, being reflected uh, in the imagery, in the statuary, in the art, in the very dedication of the building? I digress. From the Library of Congress, we'll walk just a couple blocks down the street to the Supreme Court. Again, depending on what's happening at the court, um, generally uh, by the afternoon, things have quieted down. And so we're able to always access the lower floor, which has exhibits, and then upstairs, we'll Usually, very rarely um, have we not been able to do this, but we can walk by and um, just peek our heads in to see the, the courtroom itself. Once again, on that Tuesday afternoon, I'll back up real quick, but on that Tuesday afternoon, once we've finished at the Supreme Court, it's usually 3.30, 4 o'clock. Um, and so for at that point, you're free to go and do what you'd like to do. You are within walking distance of Union Station, which has lots of, it's, it too is an architectural wonder and it's full of restaurants and shops and things and has a metro station which will take you right back um, to the hotel. So all along the way just know too that I'm at your service to make this smooth and easy so I'll be offering suggestions um, for you about where to go to eat or um, whatever it is that you might need. Uh, Wednesday morning we get up, we hop on the metro and head over to Arlington National Cemetery. Once we're at Arlington, we're using a trolley system to visit the highlights of the cemetery. So we visit the, um, the Kennedy graves and then the highlight is the, um, the Tomb of the Unknowns and the amphitheater there. So we um, will observe the changing of the guard at the Tomb of the Unknowns, which is really um, a somber and impactful experience for our young people. By this point, we'll have talked enough. Hopefully, they'll really, really have it in their heads that there are separate roles. Gov government, the word government's direction, control, restraint, but there are various spheres of government that God has set in place. And the civil government is just one sphere. There's family, 
government, there's church government, there's self-government. And civil government has a limited role. When it starts to step outside the God-given role, we wind up with problems and we lose liberties as a people. But two of its roles are protection and establishing justice. And we want civil government to do that really well. And so this is a place that is a celebration of civil government fulfilling its proper role, um, defending its people. Um, so it's a great place to, to really talk about that and to um, to appreciate it in a real um, in a real serious way. So Arlington National Cemetery, um, our last stop. Oh, it's right up here. So this image in the left-hand corner is Arlington House, and that's part of the trolley tour, but we'll get off at Arlington House. And um, from Arlington House, which has an incredible story in itself, but from Arlington House, you're looking back across the Potomac River towards the city, and it's really just this expansive view over the entire city of Washington, D.C. That's where we kind of bring our formal tour to a close, um, talk through some of the, 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 the big picture things, um, and end our formal time together. So that's the day that you do not have lunch provided by me, because at that point, it's usually about 12, 1230, and we're, we're getting back on the metro, and that's free time for you in the afternoon to explore things that you want to see, whether it's Holocaust Museum, um, Museum of the Bible, Museum, um, Ford's Theater. There are just lots of things that, that I can't do. <laughs> we can't do it all. So that's um, your time. To, um, to decide what your priority would be for the afternoon. That evening, I will mention, um, usually about eight o'clock back at the hotel, um, we do a wrap up session. So it's casual, we all just come relaxed and it's a time for us to talk through what have we learned on this trip. Um, there's also some fun time that we have together. It's brief, maybe 30, 40 minutes in the evening um, and then everybody heads to bed. Um, you'll have lodging included that Wednesday night so that you you know are not rushed to try to get out of town that Wednesday afternoon. Um, Thursday uh, is checkout day and travel day. That I think covers it. Um, one of the things that is included, as I mentioned, is our um, the YouTube video seminar. So once you've registered, you'll be sent links to those videos, and then through the mail, I'll send you the printed copy of the note sheet packet and the color copies um, to complete pre-trip. Gosh, there's lots of other things that I send you along the way on a recommended reading list to prepare or some videos, um, movies, whatever, that are helpful to view ahead of time, including the HBO John Adams series. Very helpful. Uh, but anyway, I send you a list of that, those recommendations um, prior to the trip. Travel recommendations, um, airports to use, that kind of thing. Um, your flyer that you have in front of you shows in this box those optional first three days. And so if you were to do those first three days, this is what you would add to the base price. And you'll notice that the pricing is all determined by how many folks you have in your room. So lodging is the biggest part of what we have to, um, to pay for the trip. So down in this other box, this white box, it indicates just the base price for the, the DC trip only and what it includes is in this gray box. Then if you wanted to add, again, those first three days, you would just add depending on how you were rooming for that first part. All right, I think that should cover the bulk of it. <laughs> um, one last thing I like to put up here are just the names of folks who have participated with me in the past. Um, sometimes this is helpful. You'll recognize somebody's name and you are welcome to call them and ask them, you know, how did this go? What were some of the things that, that um, you wish you'd known or what can you tell me about how the trip works? So um, these are just a few of the people who've traveled with me in the past that um, may be helpful to you. Move myself up here. All right, folks, that is it. Um, if you have questions, that I can answer, please feel free to reach out to me by email um, or call me, and I'm happy to talk you through um, any questions that you may have. Thanks so much. Have a, a great evening.